Okay, so I'm going to just get us started here. Um, I'm, we're pleased to have Rush Cleveland here to interview. This is the first and we hope what is many interview series to archive Cedar Valley and Iowa musicians and their life stories yeah. and, and the backgrounds that they bring to the stage and to their music. Uh, we're here on the Octopus stage and I'm, I'm just so pleased that you've agreed to do this. So Rush, I'm going to have you just start off by telling us where were you born? Tell us a little bit about your childhood. Okay. Uh, right here. <laughs> Cedar Falls. Went to, went to Lincoln School. Went, graduated CFI. And uh, it was the normal, normal childhood, I guess. I... Uh, I enjoyed Cedar Falls. Yeah. What was it like back then? How is it different now than yeah. what you had as a child? Well, it was before the malls, before supermarkets. Yeah. You know, it was just a different, a different era. I know, or I knew where every neighborhood grocery store was. <laughs> a kid on his bike learns the town. Yeah. Hudson Road was the end of town, and Searley Boulevard was the other end. Yeah. It went out, you know, uh, Rainbow Drive towards Waterloo, but otherwise, you know, where Pete Jr. High, you know, that was all farmland, where the mall is and all that was nothing there. Yeah, so it's changed a lot. Yeah. So you yeah. could get around on your bike. <laughs> it changed a lot. Okay, so uh, was Llewellyn's open back then? Pardon? Llewellyn's across from Lincoln School? Yep. Yeah. yeah, Mrs. Lou. Yeah. yeah, yeah, awesome. That's cool. I know that. Okay, so tell me, what was the first music you remember hearing as a child? Well, uh, the radio was always on. And we were just on the edge of town towards Benson, out towards New Hartford. Yes. So in the morning it was country, and in the afternoon it was big bands. Yeah, what station would you have listened to? Uh, I don't recall what stations it was, <laughs> but it was country mornings and big band afternoons. Okay. The best, really. Yeah. Yeah. Would your family have had, in addition to radio, other ways to listen to music? Were you buying records back then? Uh, my folks had 78 records. 78. And, and I played them. Okay. You remember any of those artists? Yeah. Uh, uh, Jimmy Wakely, Tiny Hill. You yeah. Know. yeah. That's awesome. So I would like you to talk about your experience learning to play guitar. How did that journey begin for you? Uh, I'm getting out of the Marines. And I'm at the bus station, and I meet a sailor and his girlfriend. They're $30 light for their bus tickets. So I gave them the 30 bucks. And I'm standing there, and here comes his girlfriend, and she hands me a Jap gut string in a box. <laughs> I, I didn't know that was going to happen, but in there was the picture book, how to make a G chord you yeah. know, and a C chord and stuff, and that's, that's my first guitar. So you learned after being in the service. Yeah, okay. I was... Almost 21 when I got my first guitar. Wow. Okay. So I'm going to go backwards on that question a little bit. You were in the service. Yeah. Okay. Right out of high school? Yeah. Okay. I graduated in June and I left for boot camp in July. Okay. So by choice or by huh? draft? Were you drafted or were, did you choose? No, it was 1963. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So there was, the, it was a, a lucky accident, really. I'm... I'm in and I'm getting out when they're starting to fire up Vietnam. Right. I had done my time already. Yeah. So I was just lucky. Okay. If I wouldn't have joined, then I probably would have gotten drafted. So you have this guitar and you start learning by book. Who uh, were your teachers? How did you, how did you be, what was uh, the progression for well, you? Well, I, I got Joan Baez book number one. Yeah. And all the easy chords, E minor, A minor, D, C, you know, all the songs that I, that I could play. Railroad Bill, Railroad Bill. <laughs> yeah. I, and, but it was, 
when I came to school here, then I met other people just starting out. Also learning to play guitar. Yeah, we'd meet in the union. You'd meet nine or ten people there every day with their guitar. Hey, show me this, show me that. Yeah, start trading songs, trading ideas. Yeah. yeah. What years would that have been that you were a student at UNA? Uh, late six, early six, seven, I start. Okay. Okay. So. And I think at that time, you is that when you met your friend Denny Garcia? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he was a student here, too. We played under girls' dorm windows. <laughs> <laughs> All the leaves were brown <laughs> and the sky is gray. Like, you know. Yeah, they asked you to or you were trying to get their attention? We oh. did it, too. <laughs> but I must say that uh, the Cedar Valley had music in it when I started. Uh, Just, it's had a rich tradition of players. Yeah. Can you think of some of those folks, in addition to Denny, that would have been influential to you at that part of your life? Yeah. Uh, uh, Bonnie Kolak was here. Sig Erickson was here. Don and Ray Bassett. Uh, the, the rubber band. They had a coffee house right there on Searley in, uh, in college called The Cloister. Okay. And they had entertainment in there on Friday and Saturday nights. So I got to see them. And then the bands, there was Headstone and Magic Theater. You know, everybody knew how to play but me. <laughs> so I, I, ha I had to play catch up. Yeah. You know, I, I, I tried to learn how to play as fast as I could. And that, and that brings around, brings about frustration. Because you want to be better than you are, you know, and I, 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 I tried, <laughs> you know, yeah. but I knew a lot of people that knew how to play already. So, Rush, it's not a secret you knew Eddie Bowles, and if you were going to tell someone who didn't know who he was, how would you describe him, and then talk to us about how you met him? Well, um... I'm not, I don't think I'm 10 years old yet, but I'd go fishing, and I met Eddie fishing. Okay. And then my folks would give me a quarter or something, and uh, I'd go to Runkle's bait shop, and he'd give me all the minnows that had died for catfish bait. But I'd buy a couple of Dodger Colas or Dodger Cream Sodas, one for me, one for Eddie. So I, I, I knew him way before... I knew how to play. Yeah, that's interesting, actually, that you yeah. knew him before you knew how to play. But he had a he had a, a huge long extension cord, and he'd run it out to the old dump road, and he'd sit along the edge of the road and play. And then, I didn't give much thought to it till I was playing, and then I realized, whoa, you know, how does a guy like this know what he knows? You know, mm -hmm. and uh, they had the end of Eddie Bowles' benefit here, and I played yeah. two or three songs that Eddie showed me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> but he, him and his wife had a little shack there right, right where he went into the old dump. Yeah. And so I, I, I knew him since maybe I was nine or ten years old. So you learn to play guitar, and, and then you pick up some things from him along yeah. the way. Yeah, but once I learned how to play, and I knew all the players, I'd take them out to meet Eddie. I took Denny out there. I took yeah. Bunky Marlowe out there. Uh, you know, anybody that wanted to go, I'd take him out to meet Eddie. You yeah. know. And I'm sure he had many things he could show. Yeah, I mean, he goes, yeah, I knew Lewis till he got in trouble. <laughs> and he didn't know Louis Armstrong. I'm reading about Louis, and he did get in trouble, and they took him away for a while. But, yeah. So. so how would you describe Eddie Bowles to someone who doesn't know about him? I, it's, uh, he was, uh, it's just like standing next to a big tree. He's just solid. You know, I mean, I, I think he was uneducated. Yeah. You know, uh, he did uh, piece work around town for anybody. If you needed something, you'd call Eddie, and he'd, he could probably do it for you. 
Yeah. You know, but it, that's how I met him. And uh, once I learned how to play and I started taking people out there and I'd, I'd play with him. Yeah. Continuing you know. that coffee house tradition, but really almost in a blues style. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I ran a folk festival for seven years and Eddie played everyone. Yeah. Where was that festival? Right here in town. Right it was here before town. Sturgis Falls. We started to draw really big crowds for it. And then the city goes, hey. <laughs> so one year they just didn't renew us using the parks and they started, started their own affair. Yeah. You know. So in addition to Denny, in addition to Eddie Bowles, I know you've probably played in so many bands with so many people. Who are some people that come to your mind that really played a huge role in your progression as a musician? Well, they were here. Uh, Gail Moog from, and uh, Alan Ekert, uh, Doug Freeman. They were all, they all knew how to play already and they all kind of took me under their wing. Uh, Big Bill Jacobson had a house right down there uh, by the Quick Star. And I used to take lessons from Doug in the basement, you know. Yeah. And, and Gail showed me stuff. And Al, them guys, they started in the Beatle craze. I mean, they're 16 or 17 when I'm getting out of the Marines, and they're, they're doing Buffalo Springfield stuff already. Yeah. You know, and I'm railroad bill, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm plugging away at just getting started. So, like I said, I, I tried to learn as fast as I could. Yeah. You know. um, having said that, you've owned so many beautiful guitars. Uh, my first time I got to see you play would have been when I was a student here yeah. in the 1990s. I used to watch you play at the Mojo's Blues Jam. Yeah. And I used to come to watch to see what guitar. 13 years we did that. Yeah. What guitar you were going to pull out that night. Yeah. What are some of your favorites? I know that's a very hard question, but what are some of the favorite guitars that you've owned? Well, uh, I had a farm out by Allison that I bought on time, you know, on contract. Yep. And it was broken into, and I lost 30-some guitars. Yeah. You know, the, the good thing is every year I left, I'd take my seven or eight best pieces, and I'd store them with Raldo and Marcy. Yeah. So, I mean, I lost an old SG that I wished I still had. Yeah. You know, and... Uh, I had a really old uh, 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 craftsman, you know. They're they're worth big bucks now. It got stolen, you know. And I had several acoustics that got taken and stuff. But uh, thankfully, I'm still rich in guitars. Yeah, I, I know. got I got my I got my flying V. I got the first guitar I ever bought, which is a Gibson three thirty five. Yeah, uh, one hundred and fifty bucks. A guy sold it to me. It came from a Omaha pawn shop. Got the orange oval sticker in it. I still got it. And uh, I bought a Martin. You know, when I got out, I had Marine money. I bought a piano. I bought a saxophone. I bought a flute. I bought a guitar, I bought harps and harp holders, I bought a banjo, and I had uh, number four at 401, $25 a month rent. You shared the bathroom in the hallway. Mm. And I went in there and <laughs> just started pounding it out. Yeah. You know, but like I said, I, it was at a time when it was the right time to start playing. Hey, we're having a party, bring your guitar. Hey, we're, we're having a demonstration, bring your guitar. You know, I was invited to bring my guitar. Yeah. And I met other people that were playing and, hey, show me that. Or, hey, you show me that. Or, you know, uh, uh, Dwight Deason, uh, 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 Eugene Walton, uh, Tony Ogden, Steve Turner, there was just a bunch of us that were playing guitar, you know. So you're talking about a time that um, I, I don't know if 
most people know about, but really you were part of a time in the 60s and 70s when there was a lot of change. Yeah, well, you, it's, you, it's all different now. Yeah, well, how would you describe that, that counterculture moment to someone who didn't live it? Well, it's kind of like you had to be there. I, I, my term is I, called it, uh, I call it Cedar Falls' golden era. Yeah. I mean, many of the people that were here, great professors, you and I wouldn't tenure them. So they left and went other places. They went to New Mexico. They went to Arizona, you know. But uh, the, the, the players, uh, we were here. Uh, there were venues, the circle downtown. You know, Rain Tree, Lemon Tree, Music Box. Yeah, they're all three or four night, three or four nights a week. Yeah, where and was the circle located? I'm gonna just everybody. Uh, uh, Second Street. It's okay. a printing company now. Okay. Or uh, it's right close to that uh, Second and State Brewery. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, it's right down there. Okay. It was a Higby Hardware store, and then they moved out of out of town and uh, Tony Denkinger moved the circle in there. Yeah. So. So three or four nights a week you could go see music, you could play music. Yeah. Yeah. Well, about 71 I started getting paid regular. So you do the math, 50 years. You know, I had, uh, I went to California with Doug Freeman and I played bass and guitar. Mostly I played bass, he'd show me what to play, and then I'd play it and he'd jam over the top of that. But I played all the places on North Beach where Janis Joplin played, you know, where everybody played, yeah. you know. So we spent, I stayed till the Hate Street riots, and then we came home. That would be 69, early 69. Okay. Uh, Nixon closed the border. You couldn't get any pot, but everything else was there. LSD, speed, you know, all the stuff that you need. You wanted to have pot with, and it wasn't there, <laughs> and the things just went badly. Yeah. But I'm living there, and they're figuring a couple thousand runaways a month are showing up in San Francisco. You know, I mean, in every hallway, every unlocked car. Uh, uh, the park it was like a living room or a bedroom, you know, people sleep in there. I mean, the, the town did as best as it could to accept and accommodate everyone, but it just got to where they couldn't anymore, you know. But through all that time, I'm playing in uh, uh, 15 minutes, give the, bar, give the bartender your name, and then they'd call you up. One time we're playing and guys are throwing popcorn at me, <laughs> so, you know, but uh, I just, you, online it says nine out of ten people that start give it up. I don't know, for some reason, I hung in there. Yeah, do you think they give it up just because of what you just said, getting stuff thrown at them? Not well, having places just, to play. you know, you gotta, you gotta learn, you know, and it ain't easy. Yeah, you know, I uh, I did better with this hand. It was the strumming, and then I got the tip of just play with everybody and try to do what they're doing. And then a guy says, "Take everything that you're playing and try to play it twice as fast." You know, so I I got I got to where I could strum and I could hang in there. And the ability to learn and remember songs, which serves me well now. I started Very as much. a folk singer. Yeah. And I've got all that uh, behind me. And then it was country, and I got all that. And then it was bluegrass. You know, only thing I didn't do was like long hair, 70s rock. Just, I had no interest there. I never did it. I'm, I'm not a rock and roller, really. Yeah. So. So you, you played all these other styles of music. How did you come to the blues? Uh, a house party one night. They put on uh, Live at Mr. K's with Muddy Waters. And that was the... I'm going, Jesus, if they can do it, I can do it. 
I didn't realize <laughs> the enormity of that thought. But then a little while later, I ran into B.B. King live at the Regal. I mean, they're e the epitomes of some of their, yeah. some of their stuff. And uh, I, I just, you know, I worked in a summer camp in New York, and I met a guy that came up to see relatives, a black furniture mover. And he showed me some Lightning Hopkins licks that I still play today. Yes. And then I met a, a, a delivery driver for a medical service, and he showed me my ninth chords. And then, you know, I, I was in there. Yeah, it seems like the blues is a tradition th that just gets passed down. And I feel like the story yeah. you're telling is like you picked up bits and pieces. That well, journey probably really started with Eddie Bowles. And then you picked up pieces along the way. Yeah, uh, it was... I mean, God, Eddie knew it wide, a wide variety of stuff that you didn't expect him to know. You know, uh, bye, bye, blues, Les Paul, Mary Ford, you know. Yeah, and yeah. He just, uh, but he did, he did some blues, but he did all kinds of stuff. But I'm known as a blues player, but I, I'm more than that. Our, our live shows where we play, you can't play blues all night. I have some venues, that's what they want. And I play blues all night. Mm -hmm. But uh, a lot of places we play, I play everything that comes to mind. You know, I say everything from Muddy to Merle. Yeah. You know, but uh, I, I do all the old folk songs that I know. Whatever, whatever comes to mind. Uh, uh, right. Will and Gordy, they're such great players that I play songs still that they don't know, <laughs> and they're they're good enough to they follow along to get right to it. Yeah. Yeah. So you talk about Will and Gordy. I know you've played with lots of bands over the years. Yeah. Well, Dora goes. I had the same band for twenty years. Well, I was in twenty bands in twenty years. Right. You know, I just, uh, I joined a band in Albuquerque that was breaking up, and they, the guitar player wouldn't stay till the end. So I played with them six weeks, and I joined a band where nobody liked each other anymore. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that was, it was, it was different. Uh, I had to have help on Broadway and Scotch and Soda. Otherwise, the show they were playing, I didn't have to... I, I just, let's play. With those two songs, I had to, the keyboard player had to help me out. Yeah. But it was the big change. About the urban cowboy days, it folded. Places that ran four nights went to two, then down to one. Yeah. Uh, MTV, computers, drinking and driving laws, and the drinking age. We could play the Yacht Club in Iowa City on a Thursday night and make 450. They raised the drinking age. Lucky if you make two. I mean, you just cut off two thirds of your crowd right then in right. a college town. They right. can't get in no more. Right. So, you know, and MTV, uh, we'd be playing. I was with Dora then when it really started going and people come up and ask you to play stuff they heard on MTV and we're not right some bands went and did that I never did right. you know, I haven't changed a thing I have yeah. I played through disco I played through punk you know hip hop wh whatever was popular I, I didn't care I just kept doing what I was doing you know yeah. if you saw us at uh, at uh, Sunday Night Jam me and Mojo had a band and we played a lot, but like uh, House of Large Sizes, they'd make as much in a night as we might make in a couple of weeks or a month. Yes. You know, it just, things, things would change, you know. Yeah. But uh, it went from, uh, we did, uh, you know, the, the, ho the hotel and motel gigs, you know, half off on your, Meals, rooms for free, four or five night gigs, 
they just, everybody just, we ain't doing that no more. That's just the way it's all one nighters now. I don't, yep. nobody will hire you for two nights at the same place. Right. So at your age, is touring difficult? Like what will happen when you can't tour? When you can't well, play out as much? Well, Will's the band. Will Quigg's the band. He, he books the band, and uh, for 10 years, the last 10 years, Will and I have been together. And it was Jim and Will that wanted to use my name. In retrospect, I should have been more forceful in trying to use my name. I, I didn't. I didn't care about that. I mean, I've played in all kinds of bands in different names and stuff, but none of them had my name on them. So my recognition has just started in the last 10 years. People are calling us now. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I don't know, you know. But You're just going to keep going. I'm not, I'm not ego-driven. If there's two guitar players, I'm willing to let the other guy work as much as he wants. Yep. You know, I'm... I'm not, I'm not big on it. I was coming into my 60s and I had to improve. I bought a, a battery powered amp. I got a bunch of guitar books. And then I'd go to New Mexico and every winter I'd sit in the van with them books and 11 years worth. You know, that and playing a trio really forces you to grow yeah so in my mind i'm i'm playing the best that i ever have right now this is my paint my masterpiece year yeah hall of fame of iowa and going to memphis in the blues blues challenge yeah so talk about that like how did you get to how were you invited to do that um in the late 90s i did with Lewis McTissick. I was the only white guy in the band. And we played the blues contest in Cedar Rapids. We took second. We did it in Des Moines one year and took second. We didn't win, but we got a lot of jobs out of it. So I'm going through the computer and it blues challenge. So I told Will, I said, enter us. <laughs> so he did. And over 20 bands sent in their stuff, but then it comes down to where well, you got to have all original material. That, that paired a lot of them right there. And then some of them, it was like they're playing Stevie Ray with their own, with their own words. Yeah. You know, so out of that mass of applications, we were one of the four bands chosen to compete. And we won. <laughs> and I, I knew nothing. They paid us $700 for winning. I didn't know that we would go to Memphis. Yeah. I didn't know that it was an automatic berth on the Winter's Blues Fest. You know, I, I mean, I, I didn't know any of that. I just thought, well, we'll get some work out of it. So I told Will to enter us, and that's what happened. And here you go. Yeah. Is this the first time you will have played Memphis? Huh? Is this the first time you played? You will play in Memphis? Yes, I've been there and I, I have visited, but I have never played there. Yeah, it's a wonderful place. Yeah, so we're going to check it out. You should. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot to check yeah. out. <laughs> but I'm, I know all about the, uh, you know, the early blues, the one guy at a time, you know, the acoustic voice. But I come in when it, uh, blues meets electricity, Chicago. That's where I come in. Yeah. Uh, uh, Muddy Waters, Albert, Freddie, BB, you know, Sun Seals, all. That's where that's where I'm at, you know, Buddy Guy. Yeah. And I, I I've I never learned any. I've never learned one solo note for note. I did, I don't copy. That my strongest attribute as a player is. If you played 10 guys you'd, and you'd listen, you'd know, hey, that's Rush there. You, you, you know it would be me. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, and, and I, I write good tunes. 
Yeah. So, uh, and you record regularly. Every year. Every year. How many years have Since you done Since 1979, that? I've made a recording a year. Okay. Now, that, uh, like a full release or song or? No, I made cassettes in the beginning. Okay. You know, uh, Doors got some stuff that we did in 77 on tape. Mm -hmm. But since 79, I've made a tape every year. We just finished one. Uh, the, he's mixing it down now. Uh, yeah. Amy's on it, Kathy Henry Rawls on it, Sophia Landis. The girls sing six songs, and it's all blues. Yeah. All written originals by you. A lot of it is. Yeah. Some of it I did, uh, I did classics. Yeah. I, but I did it my own way. Yeah. You know. Okay, so I want to ask you about your name, Rush Cleveland. Yeah. Where does that come from? Uh, we're at a party in Florida. We're on tour down there. Uh, me, Molly Nova, Ike, Ruby, and uh, Mike. Can't remember the name. He, he's dead now. I can't remember the drummer's last name, but... We're at a party, and we're all planning to change our names, okay? Mm -hmm. So I had a list. I had Roland Waters, Shifty Winds. I don't know. I had a bunch of them. But a guy at this party yells out, Rush Cleveland. And I wrote it in the book. And January 1st, 76, that's what I went with. Yeah. Did you legally change your name, or that's your stage name? No, it's, it's stage name. Stage my driver's name. license is my real name. Okay. You know. Okay. I recently learned that, actually, I think it was at the Eddie Bowles tribute, uh, and somebody yeah. referred to you by your legal well, name. Well, in and I was retrospect, like, it, uh, somebody in, in that party in Florida had some connections with Waterloo, because Rush Cleveland was a real guy. Okay. He died in a hotel room, Okay. I think in Burlington, uh, of an overdose. Okay. But in those days, Cedar Falls and Waterloo weren't. They were two different towns. Yes. Uh, still are in a way, you know. Yeah. But uh, so I'm with Dor and we're playing the circle and there's about five guys standing in front of me going like this. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know what the hell's going on. Yeah. You know, but then uh, Rush's brother, Bob, he comes up and shakes my hand, puts his arm around me and his own, Rush's brother, and I become friends. So that, that took all the animosity and, you know, whatever weird vibes, they were gone from then on. Yeah. Did you ever meet him? Rush? The, no. The gentleman you're describing? No. no. I, I, never, I never knew of him till, okay. till after the fact. Okay. So. So we talked about some of, or you started to talk about some of the bands that you've played with. I know someone that you were close with locally was Steve Turner. Yeah. Did you get to play on lots of bands with Steve? Yeah. We played the hub <laughs> before it was Stebbs. We played there, uh, every Friday night and sometimes Saturday nights too. Uh, Steve played bass, me on guitar, Tony Ogden and Johnny Otten was a drummer. John's passed now. Yeah. Uh, Tony's in, uh, in Oregon, Steve passed. Yeah. But we were living at 1903 College, and that's, we'd sit in the basement there. I had a Vox Panther bass, and that's how we got Molly Nova playing bass. When I met her, she could play school trained at Sky High mm -hmm. on the fiddle. Yeah. And she had a Stratocaster, and she could play guitar. But we got her playing bass. So that'd be, uh, 72, right around in there, somewhere around there. Yeah. It feels like you've played all over the country. Have you ever left the country to play a show? I played in Canada and I played in Mexico. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Huh? That's amazing. Yeah. 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 Uh, who songs piano bar in uh, Ensenada? It's where the uh, Americans hung out on the weekends. Yeah. So just by going in there all the time and hanging out, I, I, got, I, got, I got the gig there. Yeah. <laughs> and then in Mexico, in, uh, in uh, Canada, I went up and, 
we're in a valley, you can get one radio station. We go to a party and I'd start playing and everybody I mean the music was so rare and so scarce yeah. that everybody just crowd around me while I'm playing. I mean it made me self conscious for a while because yeah. lots of times you play nobody'll look up. You know. <coughs> we went from uh we went from maybe Ontario all the way to BC, you know, and played all along through there. So touring around the country is something you did in the sixties and seventies. Did yeah. you was there a time that that ended and you became more local or more in the Cedar Valley? Uh, well, when you're young, you move around more, <laughs> you know. But uh, I'm seven seven to eighty six. I'm in and out, and m mostly out, you know. Uh, I got out of my truck in, in Norman, Oklahoma. I'm on the campus there, mm -hmm. university. Yeah. And I'm on a park bench. I'm playing maybe the third song, and this girl comes by, and she says, well, my friends play this place down the street. So I go down there just as the couple that's scheduled to play that night, they want to go see Willie Nelson, who's playing 100 miles away. And the owner looks at me and says, what the fuck you want? <laughs> and I says, well, I want to play. And he says, well, can you play tonight? <laughs> <laughs> okay. But so I got paid. I could pick anything on the menu. I got paid. I played. And I slept in my truck out back. So I got up that morning, I started up, I pulled out on the street, and the light was red, and out of the alley comes a big dairy bus. And on the side of it, it's written, Blues on the Move. And the light turns green, I pull in behind him, I follow him across town to the club they're playing at. They hire me on the spot. Yeah. So I did, I did two winters with them in New Mexico. Huh? Yeah. So, and through them, they, they had me everywhere, you know, Santa Fe, Cerrillos, you know, all the yeah. gold in New Mexico. And um, with them, I did, I opened shows for Brownie and Sonny, uh, uh, Commander Cody. Mm -hmm. They were pretty well connected. Yeah. So. So I want to, like, the Blues Challenge is coming. You're regularly gigging. I know you're going to enter a time where you don't play as much because of the cold. Um, we talked a little bit about, is it your goal to continue to play out as much as you can? Yeah. Um, we sit down from December 1 to March 1. Okay. We play Monday night in Cedar Rapids for Lynn County Blues Society. That's the last gig till we go to Memphis. We're going to probably just sit down in December, and then in January we'll get together and start um, the Blues Challenge, I intend to change nothing. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to, we're not going to rehearse or, we've never rehearsed. <laughs> Every, all the arrangements, everything comes, everything that comes together on stage. And the pitch is legitimate energy. There's no set list. What we play is what I call. Mm -hmm. And that's what we play. And I, I call by I see who's there. If I play like Louie Louie and the dance floor fills up, well, then we'll do uh, Gloria and some of the old rock and roll uh, yeah. that people would know. Yeah. If they get up and play country, then I'll play a little more country. You know, just. Yeah. So uh, what advice do you have? You started out when you came back from the Marines. What advice do you have for someone who wants to start now? Well, it's the, some things are the same. You got have to learn, you know, you got to learn to make your chords. You got to learn how to strum, you know, they got things here, uh, begin, uh, beginning artist night mm -hmm. and open mics and stuff. And so you just, you just got to wade in, you know, uh, I was just fortunate that when I started, I, there was all kinds of people around me that were at my level or, you know, hardest thing, you may be, you may be starting, but you don't know anybody else that is, you know, so you got to, you know, 
I, I was at a, a, good, a good spot to learn or a good place to start. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> it's a little different now. These days, starting out in music looks radically different than it would have for you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we touched on that about just all the things that came into being. When I was young, if you wanted to do something, you had to go out. Yeah. There was no staying home on it, playing video games. You know, there was no music on on the TV. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was a teenager, we go to Electric Park and they had five guys that would park, line the cars up. That's how many people were going yep. out. Yep. You know, and it was that way everywhere. A town support five or six places with four night gigs. Now it's, you struggle f for a town to support two or three with one night gigs. Right. You know, it's just, it's. It looks different. Yeah, expense and uh, the law, drunk driving. Yeah. I, I went through it twice. Wisconsin did it before Iowa. Mm -hmm. So we're playing this place outside of town and the cop got the breathalyzer right in his car and he's sitting in the fucking parking lot. <laughs> People are going home at 1130. Mm -hmm. You know, I told that bar owner, I said, man, you can't go out and talk, tell him to get out. You're killing you. And it, within a while, they were closed. Yeah. You know, it's just, just the way it was. And smoking, too. When I was in uh, Austin with Raldo, they'd do a smoking show, and then they'd do a non-smoking show. And the, the amount of money generated at the uh, bar, it was enormous, 30 40 percent. If you could smoke and drink, it generated a lot more money than no smoking shows. Right. And I, I, in the old days, Stebbs was littler than it is now. And everybody in there smoking. I mean, I, yeah. I played smoke-filled rooms, man. Yes. I mean, um, unbelievable. I mean, so I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not upset about it, mm -hmm. but it, it, <coughs> it affected things, too. Oh, yeah, for sure. <coughs> so all these venues, what are the top few that you remember? Your most, your the favorite places to play? As you look back well, on your career. Well, yeah, the, the Circle and uh, Stebbs. Uh, the Rain Tree was out here by the apartment complex. It's a laundromat now. Mm -hmm. it, it was a good place. You know, the T-Bird, uh, Carl's, the Music Box. We're just, there was a lot of places to play. Colony Club, Chesterfield, Purple Parrot. All in the Cedar Valley. All right, Cedar Falls, Waterloo, all wow. of them. Wow. So, but that was when everybody went out. Yeah. <laughs> so, it, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Rush, I want to thank you for taking the time to come in and talk. Yeah. Um, as, a fa like, as someone who started to see you perform in the 90s, um, it's interesting to hear about your background. Yeah. Um, I am surprised. I always saw you as someone who started on the blues. And you said, and and I know that not. No, Woody Guthrie is my first hero. Yeah, you know, uh, Woody, Bob, Johnny Prine. Yeah. When I heard Johnny Prine, then I realized I could write songs about anything. Because he goes, he wrote song. Last night I saw an accident at the corner of Third and Green. Yeah. yeah. He can just he can write write songs about anything. Yeah. So, but uh, being a singer songwriter has been important to me. Yeah. And I think you bring those influences into what you're doing now. Yeah, we do John Prine all the time, mm -hmm. every night, yeah. sometimes. Yeah. Uh, Tom Paxson. I mean, I'm even doing Kingston Trio. We're doing the Greenback Dollar. Mm -hmm. You know, I just, whatever I, I learned, and I have the ability to remember. I mean, I don't know how many songs I know, but I know a lot of songs. Yeah. But, you know... Whatever, whatever happens, whatever comes out is what comes out. Yeah. How many songs would you estimate you would know? I don't know. <laughs> Me and Garcia, he's a song man, too. I call him song man. Mm -hmm. You know, we're just, we used to play all night for the marijuana growers of Wisconsin. You know, we'd start about eight and we'd play till daylight. 
Yeah. And we wouldn't run out of tunes or have to repeat a tune. Mm -hmm. So we're just fortunate in that. Yeah. In, in that respect. Yeah. So. Well, again, I want to thank you for sharing a little bit about your history and kind yeah. of your life experiences. Yeah. Well, I'm intending to play as long as I can. Yeah. Uh, buddy guys out at 88. <laughs> so it's a it's by the year. Yeah. You know, and nothing's easy anymore. Uh, if it's a long drive, Will does it. If it's a short hop, me and Sherry do it. Yeah. He likes to have a few beers. Yes. So <laughs> mm -hmm. if it's a long haul, then he doesn't drink so that he can do the drive. So he can do the driving. Yeah. So that, that leads me to maybe one last question. What changes have you made in your life to allow you to be able to play? Well, I used to think after the gig, the after hours party and the drugs and the women, and now I'm more concerned about just getting through the gig. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Robert One Man Johnson just had a heart attack at a gig. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm fortunate I'm not on any, I'm not doing any, I'm not doing any meds or anything. I, I just, I've been lucky. Yes, you have. So we're just, uh, we're just going to keep playing as long as they can. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you for doing that. All right. Well, thanks. It's very for nice to have you. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Rush. All right. Yeah. Take care.